Hello, I am Dr. Shubangi Stalder, mathematics professor at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee at Waukesha. Me and my colleague, Dr. Paul Martin, who is at University of Wisconsin Stevens Point at Wausau, have created these open educational resources with the textbook and now the lectures. These lectures will go hand in hand with the book or also can be used as standalone lectures for different topics in college algebra. We have included some mindfulness exercises to allow those who have fear and anxiety issues to also be able to overcome those fears and anxieties and learn the mathematics that is presented in our textbook. We are hoping that the way we present, along with some of these other techniques, allow you to overcome some of the obstacles that were in your way to learn college algebra. This is the only time you will see me so that you can simply focus on my voice and the material presented to you on the screen. Thank you, and we are very grateful that you are giving us a chance to bring you these materials. This chapter zero will talk about preparing your mind so that you can be successful in the STEM pathway. So nursing, business, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, all of these pathways or majors or disciplines have something in common. What is that? You have to be inquisitive. You have to be willing to ask questions like, what if I make this small change here? How does that affect my results? being able to see patterns between uh, two almost dissimilar looking things or patterns just in general observing the world around you, creating extensions, how do I extend a particular idea, modeling which is looking at your experiments or observations in the real life and creating mathematical models so that you can use them to predict future behaviors. Also, as you go through the semester, we would like you to keep your eyes out for making connections between something you learned two weeks ago, two months ago, and then the depth that you develop on particular concepts. So the in-depth understanding, making connections, modeling what you observe, patterns and extensions, and being inquisitive are very important to be able to study in the STEM pathway. To help you with that studying, we will cultivate mindfulness, show you how you can use the mindfulness techniques to learn mathematics, and most of all, key ingredient in able to succeed in anything is motivation. There are two types of motivation. Intrinsic, which is internal to you, you're using internal attributes to get motivated, or extrinsic, which is outside of you. There are lots of studies that show that success, to be successful in the long run, extrinsic motivation does not help as much. So you have to look within yourself and see what motivates you. So in order to do mathematics, you have to learn how to sit idle, where you just sit and think. So because of copyright issues, I will not include the clip here, but I would like you to pause the video here, go to YouTube or somewhere, and just write Big Bang Theory, Eye of the Tiger, and watch that clip. When you are finished watching that clip, come back and resume this video. Go ahead and do that. It will show you what doing mathematics is like. A lot of sitting and staring and thinking. Did you watch the video yet? Come on, go ahead. So sitting idle is extremely important to do mathematics, as probably you have from your own experience seeing that, right? I want to share a study that was done by Dr. Timothy Wilson with you. His study showed that sitting idle is very aversive for college students. It was so aversive that some students prefer to shock themselves during the 6 to 15 minutes they were made to sit idle. There was no cell phone, no pen, nothing. They could sit and think, but they just had to sit idle. The level of shock was pre-tested to be painful, and 
What they found is that a quarter of women and two-thirds of the men preferred to shock not just once, but some of them multiple times. Remember, the shock was so aversive that when it was pre-tested, people said that even if they were paid, they would not want to get that kind of shock. So this world that we live in is so fast that our attention is all diverted in many different places. It's called monkey mind. We are distracted and, in fact, not just distracted by the stimulus around us, but we have a to-do list for most of us, which is so long that we just keep going down the list and we still, at the day ends, haven't gotten to the end of it. And what's the first thing to sacrifice? Sleep. Most people sacrifice sleep, but sleep is an extremely important thing that we do for ourselves to form long-term memories. So please do not skimp any sleep. But how do we teach ourselves to sit idle and think? Well, one way is mindfulness practice. So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is observation without judgment or self-criticism. When you practice mindfulness, it allows you to become more present in every moment, allows you to be connected and empathetic towards other people, it allows you the capability of staying positive. Cultivating non-judgment is not easy, but we can attempt as much as we can. There are many practices that will help you with this. So mindfulness or paying attention makes you more self-aware. And once you're self-aware, you can change your mindset. There is two types of mindsets, growth mindset and fixed mindset. Fixed mindset people believe that intelligence is uh, fixed and no matter how much effort you put into it, nothing is going to change. However, research proves that wrong. Growth mindset is the ability to believe that effort is going to change your intelligence and make you smarter. And once you have growth mindset, you are able to ask questions, make sense of things, and understand why something works. So you want to make sure that you cultivate growth mindset and move away from fixed mindset. Of course, there's a danger in dichotomizing the situation, but just remember we're trying to cultivate growth mindset so that you can believe that hard work can actually have an effect on intelligence. This is also shown in new brain research on brain plasticity, which we'll look in a little bit. So being in the present moment is extremely important. So right now, I want you to pause the video here and see if you are here right now. And I don't just mean physically sitting in the chair listening to me, but are you here completely with your whole body, mind, and essence? If you notice that you are distracted in some form, I would highly recommend See if you can just breathe, become focused, and hit the pause button on your life. So whatever you're doing, stop it and just sit wherever you are at and take a look and just observe your breath. The three breath practice is extremely important in times when you are feeling agitated, distracted, fearful, just bringing your focus back to your breath, slowing your in and out breath, will make amazing difference in how quickly you calm down. So by observing your body, your breath, and just inhaling and exhaling will allow you to shift your focus from whatever it was that you were distracted by. So the three breath practice will come in handy. And the three breath practice is not that hard to do. Just sit with feet on the ground and your body just relaxed and soft. You can even close your eyes, but if you're anxious, leave the eyes open. Don't focus on anything and simply bring your attention to your breath. Breathing in, soft, long inhale. Breathing out, soft, long exhale. Breathing in, soft, long inhale. Breathing out, soft, long, exhale. Breathing in, soft, long, inhale. 
breathing out, soft, long, exhale. This is the breathe, breathing practice, and we call it three breaths, but you can make it four, five, six, however long you need until you are completely relaxed. This symbol that you see right here that we have created specially for breathing, that means that when you see that, it's just saying, don't forget, you can always do soft inhale, exhale, breathe in, and that will allow you to get more grounded, more focused, and do problems that you are working on. It's a really good practice to bring in during an exam if suddenly you find yourself not being able to do a problem. Just sit back, don't look at the problem, relax and breathe. The next couple of practices are the loving kindness and the body scan. These practices, if you are able to do every day or every other day, are very useful in changing your outlook and your attitude and you become more positive. So the loving kindness practice is simply repeating these phrases or you can modify them to however uh, you think fits your personality, but you repeat these phrases five times. You'll say, may I be filled with loving kindness, may I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. Do that on your own two more times. All right, assuming you've done it two more times. So you always start out wishing these things for yourself. Some of you may not be able to say these things to yourself and it's okay. Just keep saying it. Eventually you will realize that you mean it to yourself. The whole loving kindness practice is you repeat the phrases five times for yourself and then you find other people in your life who you can say these things to. We won't go into many details here, but you can, for example, replace the word I with, say, your teacher or your spouse or your children or friends or even people who have hurt you. If you do this practice regularly, you will see the transformation not just in yourself, but what it does when you actually interact with people who have hurt you or people um, who you love. It really is an unbelievable practice. The body scan practice is handy because you can do it as fast or slow as you want. In the textbook we give you detailed practice. Here we're just going to do a short version of it so you can experience what it can do for you. Remember, my, whenever you are anxious or when you are upset, you know, you're emotionally charged. And my teacher always said, if that happens, just recognize that it simply has two components, thought component and a body component. Even when you're anxious, there's a thought component and a body component. The thought component you cannot control. Thoughts come and go as they please. But you can choose to observe your body when you are in distress. So to do that, just bring your attention in your mind's eye to your body, present here and now. Sit straight, feet on the ground, and in your mind's eye, just take your attention to your feet and ankles. If you have lots of time, you can go one toe at a time, so you can, you know, break your body apart in smaller pieces to observe, but we're just going to do a really broad practice here. So just observe both your feet and your ankles, Take your attention now to the calves. Remember, you're not changing anything. You're not doing anything. You're just observing. Bring your attention to your abdomen and your chest. Relax the shoulders. Relax your throat and the jaw. And bring your focus to your hands. 
forearms, upper arms, your throat, your mouth, relax the tongue, relax the jaw, relax the eyes, and bring your attention now to the forehead. And the whole head, back of your neck, your back, back of your thighs, back of your calves, and the bottom of your feet. And now scan the whole body from head to toe. And if any part of your body calls for attention, just take your mind's attention to that part. That's it. That's it. That's the body scan practice. I will tell you, this practice has shown tremendous effect for my students who are anxious on exams or even in the classroom. It has even helped myself. At first, I was really skeptical of all of these practices, and I thought if it were that simple, everyone would be doing it. But even if it sounds simple, it's not really that simple when you actually start practicing, but the benefits are tremendous. I once was stuck in an airplane, and I got a panic attack because I have claustrophobia. And when that happened and I did this body scan practice, it literally in five minutes, I was completely fine. And until that moment, I had never experienced any kind of panic attack of that kind. So if you are prone to these kind of negative emotions, this would, these, one of these practices will come in handy. We're giving you this many practices because we're all different and so don't know which practice will work for which person. So try them all and see which one is for you. And so why should we practice mindfulness practices? Because we're trying to cultivate compassion for oneself and others. Learning can't really happen if you're constantly worried about what other people are thinking of you or even what you are thinking of yourself. Usually people are much kinder to other people than they are to themselves. So when you practice mindfulness practices, it makes you a better listener to others and to yourself. You become less reactive, so you're less likely to say, oh, I'm stupid if you don't get something. You might spend a little more time to get deeper into why you're feeling the way you're feeling. So show kindness and compassion and non-judgment to yourself. This is extremely important before you can show any of these things to other people. Practicing mindfulness will also help you respond with less frustration and you will develop more patience. In the book you will see these, these icons for showing kindness and one thing at a time quite a lot. And that is to remind you that, you know what, even when things get overwhelmed, you just take your attention to a smaller chunk of what you're doing. So if a big problem uh, is freaking you out, just go to a smaller part of it and do one thing at a time. The more mind space you devote to multitasking, the less efficient you will be. In fact, they've shown that for every additional task, you are almost 20% or 25% less efficient. So don't do multiple things at once. Breathe, stay focused, stay positive, and only do one thing at a time. This is hard, all these things that we're telling you, because we are creatures of habit energy. Habit energy means when a stimulus comes at us, we are basically on autopilot, and we never really stop and think, is there another way to react? We just automatically react. Mindfulness will help you become more aware of your habit energy. And this, in return, will make you more open to describing situation with other possibilities. It's also very important to leave the ego out the door. Ego does not serve you well in learning capacity. In learning, the teacher and the student has to leave the ego out the door. It's very important, if you do that, to ask for help when you need it. Don't just sit there when you're struggling and not talk to your fellow classmates, tutors, teachers. Your teacher should be a primary source of getting help. The teacher knows a lot more mathematics and also a lot of techniques they will have to help you if you are struggling. 
So you might wonder why we're giving you all these things, because new research on brain plasticity shows that our brains are malleable, and at any age, we are able to learn. So they're malleable, and the more, the harder you work, the better your brain will become. They've also done studies that show the more mathematics you learn, the smarter you become. The brains become truly more efficient and smarter the more mathematics you do because you're exercising your brain power. So human brains are hardwired to do mathematics, and at any age, you can grow new neurons. But you have to help it, too. You have to create a situation with good exercise, nutrition, sleep, because sleep is what forms long-term memory. So don't skimp on sleep. So another technique in, in, in addition to mindfulness is visualization. It's very, very important that you be able to visualize success. If you can visualize it, then you will actually be able to reach it. But if you cannot visualize, then you can think of another situation where you were successful and superimpose that memory into a mathematic situation so that you can trick your brain into thinking that you are visualizing success in mathematics. Visualizing sometimes can be even more effective than actual practice. That's what a lot of studies have shown. Teacher and students can benefit from this exercise. But right now we're talking to you, and so it will be very important if you spend a little time visualizing because you might wonder why it works. Olympic athletes and a lot of famous CEOs, athletes, they all use visualization technique. You are basically, even though you're not physically moving your arms or limbs or your actual taking an exam, if you imagine taking an exam, your brain does not know a difference whether it's just you visualizing it or whether you are actually in that situation because the same part of your neural networks is activated. And when that's activated, you just have a conditioned response. Your brain knows how to respond in particular situations. And that's the reason for why active, repeated visualizations are necessary. So if you're taking an exam, imagine getting an A on it and sitting there and taking an exam. But you can't just do it for 30 seconds. You have to sit like for a 20-minute quiz, sit there for 20 minutes, visualize, taking problem after problem after problem and getting every single one. It's very important to visualize because that will completely help you overcome fear. And also, not just that, you truly will go to an exam and it will be as if you have visualized it a hundred times and it's going to be not a very abnormal situation to you. But imagination is the key. You have to learn to imagine being successful. So. In the visualizing exercise, please superimpose another memory over the one that you are having trouble with, and it will allow you to visualize taking exams and succeeding at them. Again, mindfulness and breath control will allow you to calm your response and positive talk maintained in and out of classroom. Watch your language. And then you can even make vision boards and write down what your goals are to reach them. So if you can dream it, you can get there. So in mathematics, you know, you have sequential knowledge buildup. So mastery-based learning means you have to have knowledge of previous material in order to be able to go up. It's almost like you're going up a ladder. So like the bottom rung you can think of as numbers in kindergarten, and then you keep going up the ladder the more mathematics you learn. It's like when you start climbing up the ladder and you step on a broken rung, you're going to fall down. And that's what could happen if you don't have sequential knowledge and keep retaining it as you go forward. So that's why we are expecting you to be masters of material from every week to week to week as we go forward. So answer the following questions so that we can discuss what is mathematics and so on. So answer what is mathematics, what is a problem, and what is a mistake. Pause the video here 
and go ahead and answer these questions. Go ahead, pause the video and answer what's mathematics to you, what's a problem, and what's a mistake. You don't have to look anywhere, just on your own. What do these words, what images or words are invoked when you hear these words? All right, assuming you have come back, well, mathematics, well, if you looked in the dictionary, it's the study of numbers and their forms, arrangement, and associated relationships using rigorously defined literal, numerical, and operational symbols. Mathematics is also observing the world around you and characterizing things or objects in different groups, components based on certain attributes. Some of you may think mathematics is problem solving and generalizing structures and patterns. All right, so as soon as you say mathematics is problem solving, of course, then the next question to ask would be what is a problem, right? So sometimes mathematics is playing with objects and just for fun replacing components with other objects to see what will happen. Like in a number system, decimal numbers, if you replace the tens with x's, you will get algebraic expressions. So this can lead to interesting structures that eventually can find use in real life. There is creativity and art involved, and so we will ask you from time to time to create things, to look at mathematics in a very different way, visually and algebraically. So mathematics is all about tools, and so you have to create a toolbox in which you keep gathering tools that you might need, like least common multiple, greatest common factor, exponents, all the arithmetic operations, and so on. So a lot of times when we do exercises, you will see the mathematician's toolbox empty, and then you get to put things in it that you think are necessary to solve particular problems. So what is a problem? Well, if I said to you, I have a problem, you would say, oh, let's come and help you and solve it. So a problem is something, what, that you probably want to solve. So a question raised for inquiry, consideration, or solution, or a proposition in mathematics or physics stating something to be done. My favorite is an intricate, unsettled question, a source of perplexity, distress, or vexation, or difficulty in understanding or accepting. As soon as you say math is all about problems, no wonder so many people get stressed out. Who likes having a problem? But if you change your attitude and say, ooh, problem, let's go solve it. Now, even if you cannot solve it, you can at least attempt. So natural, it's very natural to expect some or even a lot of discomfort depending on your previous preparation. And so if you look in the book and you solve the problems, you will notice that you will get stuck. That's why we do problems together in the classroom when we're all together. So it's okay to be confused and it's okay to say, that you are struggling and you are attempting. Now, what's a mistake? Anytime somebody has a problem and they solve, you may not necessarily solve it flawlessly right away. So to blunder or misunderstanding. So a lot of times people make mathematics mistakes because they misunderstand properties or tools that they are applying. It's very important to pay attention to the symbols and the rules and see which ones you are misapplying to figure out what the mistakes are. You know, teachers have been practicing problem solving for decades. And so when you see them, they're like Olympic athletes. That's one of my friends actually said that. But then when you are just a new beginner and you look at the teacher, you feel like you should be able to solve problems flawlessly just like that, like an athlete, an Olympic athlete. But you can't. You have to go all the way through the bottom to the top, making mistakes, and then eventually you will have the same mastery as your teacher. So acceptance of mistakes is very important, and it's very important to just not say, I don't know. Because a lot of times people will say, I don't know, is due to ego, or because they don't want to look like they can't solve something. It looks negative, but it's not. I'm telling you, don't say I don't know. Instead, say you're stuck or that you're attempting 
leave your ego out the door. So a lot of times students associate their ability or potential to do mathematics with the grades they got. Just because once upon a time you got a bad grade does not mean you are bad at mathematics. More specifically, when students are making mistakes, some of them may feel ridiculed, judged, or even stupid. It's time to let go of that baggage and empty that suitcase. We are starting anew, and you are not going to feel stupid or ridiculed or judged. This is a very different kind of environment. So please refrain from saying, I don't know, I'm stupid. Anytime you feel an urge to say something negative, stop. Reflect upon why you're saying it and see if you can find another way to say the same thing. One quick way to say I don't know is because then the responsibility of solving the problem shifts from you to somebody else. And so that's your defense mechanism kicking in. So stop and see if you can attempt. Don't give up so easily. In fact, a lot of important discoveries happen because of mistakes. And you will notice that successful people are willing, like, go look up what happened to the inventor of the Dyson vacuum cleaner. He had thousands of models that failed and then eventually one succeeded. What's the difference then? The difference is if you make a mistake, you move on. You learn and you grow. You learn and you grow. And by that, doing that process is what allows you to be successful. So a successful person is not someone who is successful right away necessarily, but people who fail and are willing to get back up and continue working, that's who is going to become successful. That's what requires the grit or hard work. Productive persistence. So avoid habit energy to say, I don't know. And don't just wait for the teacher to answer, but see if you can explore by yourself. Be inquisitive. Remember, we're preparing for STEM discipline. Being inquisitive, also being inquisitive, exploring, and why something works, understanding that will increase your long-term retention. So again, let's stress getting help is very, very important when you need it. Don't have that ego. Don't have a negative attribute to who is getting help. It's not just dumb or people who are not sure what's working that get help. Even people who understood everything can get help to explore their ideas further. So getting help will reduce your frustrations and can make your learning an efficient, productive, and even a happier event. Personal care, we already talked about, sleep, nutrition, exercise, Stress management, very important. Don't let the stress get to you. You're not alone. We're all of us, all the whole class and your teachers and all the people who develop this. You don't understand how many people are responsible who contributed to the material that you're seeing right now. Teachers from all over, students from all over, they've all sent us suggestions to improve. So this is all work of teachers and students. And again, if you have suggestions, feel free to email me or, you know, post a comment or something. We will be very happy to incorporate your suggestions in the next iteration of these materials. So if you want to succeed, if you really, really, really want to succeed, all you have to do is be honest with yourself and see that doing mathematics is a challenge for your brain and you're making yourself smarter and know that your positive attitude is going to be a key. So attempt, which is try, 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 try. No, I don't know. And be willing to fail. Don't give up. If you fail, you get back up. You fail, you get back up. And that is your path to success. I want you to find your mathematical voice. So we want to make sure that small successes lead to bigger successes for you. And it increases your self-esteem. So start believing in your abilities. We have set some very high standards for you. And it's only because we believe that each and every one of you can meet it. Some need more work than others. But if you're prepared to do the hard work, you can get there. This will require 
a shift or change in the expectations from yourself. It requires a tremendous commitment from you, and there are no fast fixes or pill to swallow. We can't just stamp something on your piece of paper and say, you got it. It's very hard work and sweat, and there may be tears and crying involved, but just remember that if you're willing to go past that, that we are here to help you, then small successes will allow you to reach your goal.